how to read the Bible. Read it reverently. Read it with expectancy. Come to the Bible expecting God to speak to you. And read till he does speak to you. Come with expectancy that every time you open the scriptures, God has a message for you. And then read it with dependence. The Holy Spirit inspired the writing of this book, and the Holy Spirit can interpret this book to you. And I have come to many points in the Bible that I did not understand, and I would get on my knees and I'd say, Lord, show it to me. And I found the meaning of that passage on my knees by the Holy Spirit. Good morning, church family. Come on, let's give Jesus praise in the house today. Good morning. Happy Sunday. Happy Sunday. Oh, my gosh. Hey, may the Lord bless you, keep you, cause his face. We will see you next week. Just kidding. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. It's not my birthday. Uh, it is tomorrow, but thank you so much. I appreciate that. You guys are amazing. And I feel old. Um, uh, thanks so much for being in service. To, it just threw off like my whole message. Uh, I feel like I'm preaching left-handed. Uh, thank you so much for being in the house today. My name is Pastor John, one of the staff members here at New Anthem Church. And uh, it's not my birthday every week, uh, so please come back if you're new, uh, and it, there will be a, a uh, normal um, sermon start. Uh, thank you for being in church today. We want to welcome you if you're a new guest or first-time visitor. We also want to welcome all those tuned in, watching by way of Facebook, YouTube, and our applets. Welcome our online audience this morning as well. And man, I am like just so fired up. Uh, and I want you to know, and I just wanted to start with this, and we always start by like giving giving Jesus praise. And um, for those that maybe you're new in the last few months, I just want to give some context around that because it's not about like hype, right? It's not about like trying to create or like fabricate some type of uh, excitement um, out of nowhere. Um, but really, when we start the sermons praising God, uh, it's it's really centering our hearts around the reality that that God is here and He's met us here every single week. He meets us here. He's present with in our midst and wants us to leave here different than the way that we came in. And so it's really giving recognition to that. I was never told that. I went to church my entire life and I was not told until like way too late, like like embarrassingly too late. And I went to a dozen different churches and I was not told that God was present here and was wanting to speak to me until I was like in college. And I just think that just it shouldn't be how the church works because God is here. God is present. And so when we're giving praise when we're when we're responding to the gospel it's not about hype it's not about like trying to like hype up like your pastor's sermons it's about acknowledging the presence of god and responding in faith to what we believe that god is going to do amen so i want to encourage you to lean in and bring a spirit of expectation that's actually one of our values here at new anthem church to bring a spirit of expectation and anticipation to the house so that we stay on mission, stay on focus. And this doesn't become a thing that I like to call as playing church games, where we're just trying to check the box, just trying to come to church because that's what good Christians do, because God is so much more for us, amen? amen. I'm so fired up today, and uh, not because it's my birthday tomorrow, but because of where we're going in our text today. We're continuing on in our series called Unveil, and for those of you that have maybe not been with us yet, um, we're, we're demystifying the Old Testament. Um, it's easy to stay away from the Old Testament except like the Sunday school scriptures that we all know, trying to maybe preach them in a fresh and new way. Um, because the, uh, perceivably, the, the God of the Old Testament seems more moody than the God of the New Testament. As we discuss every week, God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And as we look under the hood of what is really going on in some of these passages, we actually see a very consistent God who's full of love, 
full of grace, full of truth that he's wanting to extend to his beloved. And so today where we're going in scripture is very, very similar. It's very, very contentious. Um, I, we're talking about Joshua and we're finishing his story. In Joshua chapter six, we actually see like the most famous part of really his legacy. Uh, as we discussed last week, Joshua was taking over where Moses left off. God had made a promise to Moses, continued through this leader, through Moses' successor named Joshua, who was this uh, diligent leader, who was this charismatic leader, in this military leader leading the people of God, God's chosen people, the apple of God's eye to this promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey. And so we see God show up or Jesus show up in this form. He says, I am the leader of the archangel armies of the Lord, and I have a mission for you. And ultimately, what I believe God was preparing Joshua for was in this next chapter, this, this ultimate battle between uh, the people of Israel and these people of Jericho. Jericho was this region, it's about 22 uh, square miles. Um, in this uh, ancient region, uh, this was a vile people. In fact, earlier in our passage in the book of Joshua, we see Joshua sending out spies to check out the, the like, what, what, what is this place? Like, God called us to take this land. He said, this land is ours. It says we need to conquer this land in order to get to this promised land, this land flowing with milk and honey. We need to check this out. And so he sent in spies into this land. And they came back with news that it, uh, this land was full of giants. And there's actually some theological uh, theologian debate on this. Some people uh, think that they were just kind of saying that, that they were trying to make it seem a lot worse than it was because even though, yes, this was God's direction, hoping that Joshua would be like, you know what, maybe let's not take the land. And uh, other theologians believe it was actual giants, and we're going to get into the text, and we're going to answer that question this morning. And so they send in these spies, only one out of all of these people uh, that ultimately the scripture uh, directs us to were evil and vile. Uh, there was evil in their hearts. There was only one that ultimately heeded uh, this uh, call and actually helped these spies out, gave them protection and hid them so that they could fulfill their mission, which was a young girl named Rahab. And we're going to talk about her at the end. And so we are jumping into our story after the people of Israel, led by Joshua, were given this directive to march around this 22 square mile city. To just give you some context, Clinton Township was like 29 square miles. And so to walk around this city a total of seven times. And more directives than that, they were given uh, this direction to, sometimes they needed to be silent when doing, sometimes at the end they needed to shout, sometimes they needed to blow trumpets. And so this is the seventh time around. And I gotta say this morning, I was tempted to preach this the way everyone preaches this message. Like whatever your enemy is, you just keep walking, you just keep marching. Whatever lap God has you on, and the walls will fall, and you will find your promise. It preaches so easy, doesn't it? And yet, when we look at this text exegetically, I believe there's such a richer truth that will ultimately define the life of victory that God has planned for you. Did you know that God planned you to have a life of victory? That God created you to be victorious. That's not true for the, the varsity Christian or the person sitting to your left, your right, or across the aisle. This is God's truth for you. God created you from, you've been created by a God of victory, a victorious God who always wins, who always comes out victorious. Have you read the back of the book? Like God, God wins, God's victorious. So this victorious God that created us from a place and a stance and a posture of victory and winning created you to do the same. You were created in the image of a victorious God. And today, we're going to talk about the implications of that and ultimately see what that reality has to do with us in this story. So, so let's catch up with Joshua on this last day marching around the city. Joshua chapter 6, verse 7, or we'll start at verse 15. And we're going to read so much scripture today, maybe more than ever, and I am not sorry. 
It says this in verse 15. On the seventh day, they got up at daybreak and marched around the city seven times in the same manner, except on that day, they circled the city seven times. On the seventh time around, when the priest sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the army, shout, for the Lord has given you the city. And the city and all that is in it are to be devoted to the Lord. And only Rahab the prostitute and all who were with her in the house shall be spared because she hid the spies we sent in. But keep away from the devoted things so that, so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise, you will make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble on it. All the gold and silver and articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord and must go into his treasury. When the trumpet sounded, the army shouted, and at the sound of the trumpet, when the man gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. So everyone charged straight in, and they took the city, and they devoted the city to the Lord and destroyed with the sword every living thing in it, men, women, young, and old, cattle, sheep, and donkeys. And Joshua said to the two men who had spied out the land, go into the prostitute's house and bring her out and all who belong to her in accordance with your oath to her. So the young men who had done the spying went in and brought up Rahab, her father and mother, her brothers and sisters, and all who belonged to her. They brought out her entire family and put them in a place outside the camp of Israel. And they burned the whole city and everything in it. But they put the silver and gold and articles of bronze and iron into the treasury of the house of the Lord. And Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute with their family and all who belonged to her because she hid the men Joshua had sent as spies to Jericho, and she lives among the Israelites to this day. May God bless the reading of his word today. Would you bow your heads with me, church family? Father God, today we come before you, and we're asking for you to build our faith. As I, we were talking about this idea of living a victorious life, for some of us, our faith has waned in such a way where we're not believing that that can really be the reality for us, that, that victory isn't something that, that maybe we will have access to in, in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, but a life that we could wake up tomorrow and step into a victorious life. How are we going to get that done? And the reality for us today, God, is we need to trust you to be able to move us, transfer us from maybe the dominion of darkness that we are in, as it says in Colossians, transferring us into the kingdom of the son you love. And this is how we step into a life of victory. And so God, as we dive into your word, as we take apart your scriptures, God, would you just read our hearts? Would you open up our hearts and would you imprint on our hearts your truth, your word, that would be like food and sustenance for our soul. And so God, we center our hearts around you today. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for meeting us here. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. amen. The, the text that we, we just read through uh, is a contentious one. And it's a contentious one in, in multiple ways. Interestingly, as, as contentious as this text is on a theological level, um, this is also one that is very easy to misread. And the reason it's easy to misread is this is another very popular piece of scripture that some of us might have experience with if we grew up in church as kids, right? You remember the, the felt boards and the coloring books, Noah's Ark, right? Um, the story of, of Joshua marching around the walls of Jericho. For you, maybe it wasn't a felt board. For me growing up, it was Veggie Tales, you know? And so the depiction uh, that I have in my head when I would think about this story is this cucumber hopping around the walls of Jericho <laughs> with these peas up on the wall, taunting them and making fun of them. And then they shout and, and then they, they run out of there and they run out of there all scared and in where I think so many of those are, are just so awesome and so helpful and, and such a cool way to put the word of God inside us, what can happen for those of us that, that have this uh, understanding of stories like creation, like Noah's Ark, like Joshua, is we, we don't actually get the, the level of what God was actually doing. We don't get the context, and it stays, I, I like to say it this way, like we Disneyify the word of God in such a way where it's not actually helpful for our souls. Are you with me? And, and, and so 
I, I'm going to push against that. And so my hope today is, is if, if that's the, the, the image that you have of, of Joshua and the walls of Jericho, like, I don't want to, like, destroy that awesome memory you have of the coloring books of the felt board or of, of Veggie Tales. Like, I love me some Veggie Tales. However, there is some greater truth in this story that I just got to be real honest with you. Like, I, I, I barely have heard preached in church. And, and the reason I believe that is, is because you, you have to dig a little bit and you have to talk about weird things to get to the truth. And you're going to fully understand what I'm talking about as we dive in. Let's just jump in and, and, and let's just call a spade a spade and lay everything out on the table. Like, yes, like this was a city and, and, and yes, this city was in the way of, of the people of God. They, they, in, in this moment, the people of Jericho were enemies of God. And at a glance, with no other information, the, the punishment and the result of what happened to the people of Jericho, to me, has always seemed very excessive. Anyone else? Okay, so, so verse 20 says this. When the trumpet sounded, the army shouted, and, and, and at the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave this loud shout, the walls collapsed, so everyone charged straight in, took the city. They devoted the city to the Lord and destroyed with the sword every living thing. Men, women, young, old, cattle, sheep, donkeys, probably even the pet dogs. Like, what did the animals do? <laughs> You're taking everyone out. What is going on in this text? For me, at a glance, this seems excessive. And if we're being real honest, this is a classic verse that atheists and agnostics love to turn to and bring this argument to the table. Hey, um, you, why would I worship? And, and how could you resolve to worship a, a God who's called loving, called gracious, but ultimately commands this kind of violence? This wasn't Joshua's command and decision. This was God's charge and directive. Wipe everything out. And so what I want to do today in this first part is, is, is once and for all, I want to lay this out on the table because there is a very specific type of evil that it says this specific people in this specific region were ultimately dealing with. It's a very, very specific type of evil. Now, now, let's get on the same page with something. It wasn't that the people of Jericho were just like God branded them enemies of God. It also was not true that the people of Jericho were just bad, right? Like, God's not about just wiping out bad people. We've said maybe once a month here for the last four years, God did not send his son Jesus to this earth to go through all the trouble of living this perfect life, doing miracles, and get nailed to a cross to make bad people good. And if that's the theology that you have about the gospel, you have an incorrect theology. That is not why God sent Jesus. It was not to make bad people good. It was to make imprisoned people free and dead people alive. Amen. Now, what's our evidence of this? The life of Jesus. The Bible says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, meaning we can look at Jesus and know exactly what God is like. So if God didn't come to make bad people good, what, what, like, how do we know that? Because Jesus got in trouble and ultimately got nailed to a cross by doing nothing but hanging out with the lowest people in society, hanging out with sinners, hanging out with what we would describe as awful, bad, disgusting, vile people. This is who Jesus was drawn to most with the message of hope and the message of the gospel, okay? So it would be a contradiction for the Old Testament God to just destroy and annihilate bad people and then Jesus to be doing life with them, inviting himself over to their house and feeding them and giving them water at a well and protecting them and making sure they don't get stoned and, and with rocks thrown at them, but sending all the people away that are going to do that. It would be a contradiction for the God of the New Testament to act in the exact opposite way, which means what? There is something else going on here in the text. There's something else going on here in this text. Now, we're going to read a lot more scripture because the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 18 actually speaks prophetically to this people that they were going to be taking over and, and what was going on in their hearts. So before they actually ran into them, we actually get a bird's eye view into what is going on in the hearts of these people of Jericho. Let's read it together. Deuteronomy 18 verse 9. Watch this. 
when you come into the land which the Lord God has given to you, you must not, you, uh, you shall not learn to follow the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through fire, or one who practices witchcraft, or a soothsayer, or one who interprets or omens, or a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. For all who do these things are a abomination, not my words, the words from the Bible, to the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord your God drives them out from before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God. For these na nations which you will dispossess, listen to soothsayers and diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not appointed such for you. This is what was going on. Witchcraft, sorcery, activity with the demonic. There was a connection, a communication, and a relationship with the demonic that God ultimately wanted to deal with here. And just so we don't get overly grateful for the world we live in today, like, man, that sounded crazy back then. The world looks exactly like that today. We just call it karma, and we just call it crystals, and we just call it good energy and good vibes, which almost sounds like spiritual, but we want to cut God out of it. It's the same thing today. What one pastor would describe as new days, old demons. New days, old demons. In fact, I just saw this. I was scrolling through social media, and uh, it was, uh, it, I, I forgot what uh, channel it was, but um, this thing just came out. They're selling it on Amazon. It's called a Christian Ouija board. Yeah, yeah. yeah you can buy it on Amazon, $29.99. A Christian Ouija board. And instead of like the little magnifying glass thing, I don't know, I've never used a Ouija board, I've never played the game, but like it's a, it's a cross. And so, and so if Satan isn't going to be able to get this job done through actual Ouija boards, he's going to infiltrate homes of what I would say are either Christians or people that think they're Christians to get the same work done. New days, same strategy, old demons. And isn't it interesting, in our list of what was going on in this Canaanite descent people in the land of Jericho, the first thing that isn't men that's mentioned isn't directly witchcraft, isn't directly uh, um, uh, the, the omens and, and the spells and all of these things. That's not mentioned first. What's mentioned first? What was happening to the kids? What they were doing, how they were sacrificing little boys and girls making them pass through fire, putting them to death, torturing them, mutilating them. And can I tell you, we see the exact same thing happening in our world today. Satan's trying to destroy our kids. Satan's trying to destroy our kids mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, any way that he can. And he's going to do this not through all of this ritualistic uh, get passing through fire. No, changing the collective mindset and ideology so everyone thinks it's okay to physically mutilate a child, to change their gender, to change the mindsets of everyone in, in, in this new idea that regardless of how God created you, you can be whoever you want to be, and you can go through whatever measures you want to go through to be whoever you want to be. New days, old demons. So we need to build some context around this because I can tell some of you are so a little bit skeptical, and I love that, by the way, because I was too. How do we know that this is demonic activity? How do we know that this is demonic activity in nature? One of the things we talked about, interestingly enough, in the story of Noah, is that most people get that wrong too. And they think, people were bad, God killed everybody. And that's not the narrative. Because everyone skips the first part of chapter 6, where it talks about this demonic strategy. The Nephilim had come into the earth, which was the, this demonic race that were inbreeding, it says, with the daughters of, uh, with the, the daughters of man. It says this in Genesis chapter 6, verse 4. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward. 
when the sons of God came into the daughters of man, they bore children to them. These were, watch this, mighty men who were of old and men of renown. This is a very specific phraseology that's used from the original language, from the original Hebrew, only to describe these crazy supernatural beings, half-breed beings that were these giants in the land. What Satan was trying to do is wipe out the race of man because he knew that Jesus was going to be born through the bloodline of mankind. And he was trying to affect and infect this bloodline. And what we see happening, if we follow the ge genealogy, you want to know where the Nephilim land? Jericho! <laughs> no. Okay, but how do we know that? How do we know that? Okay, so that was Genesis chapter 6. We're in Joshua chapter 6. Watch this. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given you Jericho into your hand with its king and mighty men of valor. These two phrases are pulled from the exact same Hebrew phrasing to describe this demonic race, which, by the way, Goliath and all of his brothers were born. That's why they were nine feet tall. Okay, so, and, and remember, the spies earlier in, in chapter three and four, the spies, when they scoped it out, there's giants in the land. Of course there's giants in the land. That's where the Nephilim settled. We see the same activity all through the Old Testament. So, here is a good rule of thumb. When we see absolute destruction, when we see God annihilating and wiping out people, what is going on? Look for evil, look for sorcery, look for d demonic strategy, and look for perversion, because these are always something that God's style is to deal with swiftly and intensely. How do we know that? How did he handle the, the people of Noah? It was a flood. How about Sodom and Gomorrah? Well, wait, 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 I promised not to do a flood anymore. Oh, fire and brimstone. <laughs> like, people of Jericho, shout, walls, fall, everyone goes in. Everyone's murdered. Why? Because what was going on was a possession, was this demonic activity that needed to be wiped out. God vanquishes evil, not just bad people, but people that fully give themselves over to the ways of the devil. Are you with me? Okay, verse 20. <laughs> verse 20 says this. When the trumpet sounded, the army shouted, and at the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a shout, the wall collapsed. So everyone charged straight in, and they took the city. Okay, hold on. Because literally four verses earlier, it says something different. On the seventh time around, the priest sounded the trumpet blast, and Joshua commanded the army, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. So, did God give this land, or did the people of God have to take this land? Answer, yes. <laughs> this morning, friends, what if I told you that stepping into this victory that God has planned for your life requires two things. One, discovering the promises of God, determining what has God given you, what has God spoken to you, what has he put in your hand, and then two, having the faith to take the step and take what he's given you. This doesn't preach very popular because there's two, two styles of thought here. Some people would say, no, God just does it. Yeah, I mean, sure, we have to have, like, faith, but, but God does the work. Like, we don't, we don't have to do anything. Like, we're going to just, like, let, let, let go and, and let, let God. But God says, no, there's some personal responsibility. Like, faith doesn't oppose our effort. Faith opposes our earning. Like, we don't have to earn the love of God. It's extended to us freely. We don't have to work towards it. But in our walk with Christ, no, there's some effort. There's some work. There's some sweat equity. So it's not about just seeing. This is why we can't just stop at seeing the promises of God because we don't walk by sight. We walk by faith, not by sight. And so it takes both. We have to see, we have to know, discover the promises of God, what God has called for us, the life that God has for us, and then take steps of faith to take that which he has handed to us. I'll give you an example. When I was really young, God spoke to me and said, I, I, I have a story I'm going to speak through you, and you're going to preach 
to people, and you're going to see lives transform. I'm going to use you despite you, despite your brokenness, despite your imperfections, despite your failures and your insecurities and your depression, and despite all this stuff. Even, I'm going to even use those weaknesses to make much of me. So, so you're going to be out of the way. I'm going to use you to make much of of my name. And I was like, awesome, I'm ready for the microphone. But instead, he put a plunger in my hand and I cleaned a youth center for a year. And I scrubbed toilets and I cleaned my church. And, and then I was like, okay, I've proven myself. I'm ready for the microphone. <laughs> and I went like this and he put a Red Bull in my hand. And he was like, you're going to stay up all night and hang out with kids. And you're going to tell them about Jesus. And you're going to tell them that you love them. And you're going you're to try to show them the truth of my word. We, it, we can have a promise from God. But then we have to work it. We have to work it. God might have extended to you a gift and given something in your hands, but there might be a place where he's saying, oh, no, yeah, no, that's, that's awesome. That's a gift. That's a blessing. You're welcome. You got to work it. Amen? Amen? Come on, turn to your neighbor. Tell him, neighbor, you got to work your gift. Turn to your other neighbor. Say sorry for choosing them second. And say, neighbor, you look real good. You look real good. So sometimes we have to work what God puts in our hand. We've said, man, I just, I just feel like God, like the promise for, for me from you is that, that you're wanting to make me a leader, a leader in my family, a leader in my, my workplace, a leader in my, and, and for you, that gift and that, that promise might be on the other side of God saying, I'm also going to give you a ton of hardship and relational tension. And as you deal with that, and as you work through that, and as you grow with that, you're not even going to notice it. But on the other side, you're going to become a great leader. Every single one of us have done this. God, I want the marriage of my dreams. <laughs> I spun around last week. I was, yeah. But I want the marriage of my dreams. You might have to work. And you want to know what work, like, let me, I'll just be, I'll just be real, like, uh, Cece and I, we just celebrated 10 years. Uh, you know, it's not, I'm not bragging. It's just, we're working harder now than in the first five. And here's what work looks like. Sacrifice. That's what it, that's what it, nine times out of 10, regardless of the category, regardless of the promise of God, the work looks like sacrifice. I'd rather be doing this, but instead I'm doing this. I'd rather have all of this, but to get there, I have to do this. Which is why the promise of the world is to get everything really fast. Seven minute abs. Nope. <laughs> right? Get rich quick. Doesn't work. MLMs. Cece would love to talk to you about those after service. Like, like all of these ideas to get to something faster. And God says, in my economy, that's typically not how it works. Promotion and elevation is slow over time, and it's a response to faithfulness and sacrifice. We got to work, and this is how we take what he's given to us. Verse 24, so they burned everything. They burned the whole city. They put the silver and gold and articles of bronze and iron into the treasury of the Lord's house. It says this in verse 25. But Joshua spared Rahab, the prostitute, with her family and all who belonged to her. Now, this is where I just get so excited. Okay. Rahab was a part of the people of Jericho. Now, we don't actually even have evidence that they helped these spies figure out how to pull this whole thing off and to, and to check out this land. We don't even have any any information given to us that she did so because God was doing a work in her heart, because she had given her life to Jesus. You want to know the information we have about Rahab's legacy? She was a prostitute. She was
was a prostitute. So not only was she a part of this land that were enemies of God, that was this demonically possessed region, but she was also living a sinful life along with all of these people. In every society, prostitutes are obviously the lowest, but she was also a woman, and in this specific culture, they were viewed as basically animals. And so she was multiple times, biblically speaking, a loser, and yet was the only people in this entire region that heeded the message and declaration from the God of heaven that this long, this land no longer belongs to the Jericho, but belongs, belongs to the people of Israel. She was the only one that heeded this message. This is where we see the heart of God. And it's, check, oh, this is such, like, this hit me last night. It's the same exact parallel as the story of Noah, right? Because everyone was wicked, demonic, given themselves over to the ways of the devil. And God just could have just started over. But he's like, hey, there's one family that has to figure it figured out. I'll save them. This is, the, this is the same picture. Everyone in this region, other than a prostitute, heeds and responds to the declaration of God over this land. And that's the girl and family that God spares. But this is where I just get so excited because God is like, like very, very sarcastic. But also, like this is, and I don't mean this like sacrilegiously, like this is such a gangster move for God. Now watch this, because Rahab, if you look at the Hall of Faith in the book of Hebrews, which talks about people thousands of years prior in the Old Testament, Rahab is actually mentioned and her faith to, to hide these spies and the role that she played in this point of scripture. But that's not the only way that this was, that it was, she was mentioned in Hebrews. The other way that she was mentioned was in the genealogy that birthed the savior of the world into existence. So in the bloodline of Jesus is not only an enemy of uh, someone who was part of a people that was an enemy of God, that all were demonically possessed and got destroyed and taken over, but she herself was also a prostitute who made it into the hall of faith. And God saw fit to bring about the birth of a savior for all of humanity through because this, friends, is the heart of God. That is the heart of God. God is not a genocidal madman. He's a loving God who vanquishes demonic evil for the good of his people, for the good of his chosen, for the good of humanity. This is who God is. Like, let this be like a warm blanket for your soul. And if he can do it, for Rahab, if he can do it for the people of Israel, if he can do it for a prostitute, if you that kind of plan and providence, what plan does he have for you? In what way is he wanting to lead you into a life of victory? And so what do we do with God's plan for victory? Well, one theologian points out that this story completes Israel's victory at Jericho, and we can learn some things about what ultimately marked this plan of victory. We can, we can figure out from this story what marked Israel's victory. Number one, if you're a note taker, you can write these down. Faith. Joshua and Israel believed the battle plan that God had, and that took faith. Number two, obedience. Joshua and Israel followed this plan of God exactly, which Israel wasn't very good at. We give major props to Israel for that. Number three, courage. Israel followed the battle plan despite the danger and despite how hated they were by their enemies, not just of Jericho, but the Malachites, multiple enemies that Israel had. Number four, endurance. Israel followed the ba battle plan over a period of time, even when it seemed like nothing was happening. Can you imagine your fifth, sixth, seven, eighth, whatever, time going around the city. At what point you're like, gosh, this better work. You ever pray that prayer? 
to God? You ever say that in your own head, hoping that God doesn't hear it? Man, this better work. I've been praying for, so I've been marching, I've been praying, I've been believing God for, this better work. Number four, trust. Israel did not rely on carnal scheming or worldly methods. Their trust was in the Lord and his plan, not human ingenuity. They trusted the plan of God for your life. And so what marks your life of victory? What faith do you need? What obedience do you need? What courage do you need? What endurance do you need? What trust do you need? And as I say that, I want to remind you that I'm not talking about trying to conjure something from within your guts. I'm talking about leaning into the person of Jesus to draw from him because he's a well that never runs dry. And where our courage and our obedience and our faith and our trust begins to wane, we can draw from that well over and over and over, not our strength, not our way of doing, not our effort, not our sweat equity, but we're going to do every single thing we can do to go to the foot of the cross and say, Jesus, I need you to be for me what I can't be for me. And as we close, I want to, you to consider this. How committed are you to the Lord? How committed are you? How committed are your ways to the Lord? And there's a reason I'm asking that. Because we're talking about this master plan for victory. But we can't have a hope or a prayer of stepping into this master plan of victory that God has planned for you if you haven't committed your ways to him. In fact, in Proverbs 16.3, it says this. Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and he will establish your plans. Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and he will establish your plans your plans. And I wonder today who needs to fully commit, maybe recommit. I've been, I've been doing my thing. I've been doing John's thing, not God's thing. I haven't committed to his ways. I've been plotting my own path. See, this is where usually where we start in our walk with Christ. For those of us, maybe you we haven't even been believers for that long. It's usually how it starts is we're like, oh yeah, I'm a Christian. God, you can go ahead and be a part of what I have going on. Where God wants to take us is where we say, God, I'm not going to take a step until you say so. And I'm going to move in the direction that you say. And I'm going to, I'm going to plot the way of my life in the way that's going to bring you most glory. And I'm going to believe that you're going to lead me by your grace and So have you committed to the ways of the Lord? I'm going to ask we just bow our heads as we wrap things up this morning. Today, maybe you love Jesus. You're a Christian. You've been following Jesus for a lot of your life. Maybe for you, you've been following Jesus recently, but you have a relationship with him. But, but maybe you haven't fully committed your ways to God. You've been making him a part of what you have going on, but not turning to him as the source of what you should have going on and saying, God, where are you taking me? Where are you leading me? I want to commit my ways, my plans to you. That is the only way to experience true victory in your life. You have to fully commit. And so maybe you're here today and you say, that's me, Pastor Don. I'm ready to, to fully commit. There's this specific area I haven't been. I, I, I've been allowing God to kind of be a part of it on my terms not surrendering my ways and my life and my way of doing things in this area, specifically to him. If that's you with all heads bowed, all eyes closed, just lift your hand in the air wherever you are. Yeah, anyone else? I'm ready to commit. I'm ready to commit. I want to commit. Yes, anyone else? I want to commit my ways to God. I want him to establish my plans. It's not working. Me trying to establish my life isn't working. Yeah, anyone else? Not too late. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. God sees it. You can Awesome. I want to say a prayer for you. God, we thank you for every single person that raised their hand, even the people that, that maybe just were unsure, unsettled. God, I know that, that you're going to provide clarity for them, but God, for the, the people that were, were confident that there were some areas that they haven't fully trusted you, haven't fully been obedient, haven't fully committed to you. First, we thank you that you're a God of grace. 
And even when we're knuckleheads and even when we do the wrong thing and say the wrong thing, go the wrong way or, or, or forget about you, God, you're right there. You're right there. You're like, let's start again. Let's do it again. Get up and try again. You give us all the faith we need to get up and to try again. We're so thankful for that, God. And so, God, I pray right now for the people that even that raise their hand that maybe are feeling shame. No, that's from the enemy, which is who's been defeated. No, God, you are going to provide conviction that's going to bring us back to a place of repentance, wholeness, healing, and restoration. And so, God, we say thank you. We say thank you for that. We say thank you for responding to us, turning to us in love. And as we draw near to you, we thank you for drawing near to us. In Jesus' name, everybody said. Amen. Everybody said. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's give Jesus praise one more time. Amen. Church family, we're so glad that you're here with us. If you're looking to get connected, we have growth tracks starting right after the service in our fireside room. It's a great way to get to know our church. It's a great on-ramp for your faith. It's also a, way to, a great way to get plugged in. We say this all the time. You weren't created to do life alone. The church was created so that we can do life messy together. Amen? So we'd love you to join us for Growth Track. It's only about half hour, 40 minutes in the back room, and I promise you won't be disappointed. Uh, our church and our uh, staff here, we pray for you every single week, and our, our prayer is always the same, and that is simply this, that the Lord would bless you and keep you, cause his face to shine upon you, turn his countenance towards you, be gracious to you, and give you peace. Why? Because the best is yet to come. We'll see you next week.